Let us pray. Oh God, on this special day, as we remember that entry into Jerusalem, help us to prepare for your entry into our lives. May there be more of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may that same spirit that almost prompted the rocks to cry out, may it be alive and present in our hearing today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Regular worshippers would know that I normally come out the front to speak, but with the mic stand and the setup, it, I think it'd feel too much like Seinfeld. So I'll stay here and um, give the message for the day. Uh, in our prayer before the service, um, Yvonne was sharing about the song that was on her heart, Right On, Right On, as we came um, to worship this morning. And Mel was sharing about the song that was on her heart. Um, this was a song that I was thinking about this morning. Peter and John went to pray. Some people know it. They met a lot, they met on the way. He held out his palms and he asked them for arms. And this is what Peter did say. It was a song that I learned in Sunday school many years ago. And the reason why that was on my heart this morning was because it's Palm Sunday. It's got nothing to do with Palm Sunday, that song, but there's a story here. I always found it very confusing. And this was back in the days when in Sunday school you learned by repetition. I couldn't understand how a, a lame man was holding out his palms and asking for arms. That made no sense to me. How can you hold out your palms if you don't have any arms? And if you don't have any arms, why? Like, I couldn't understand. Shouldn't a lame man, someone who doesn't have any legs, it didn't make any sense to me. And so then I remember in Sunday school when the teacher said next week is Palm Sunday, I remember thinking, oh, we're holding out our palms. Palm Sunday is when you hold out your palms and you get an Easter egg. I was very disappointed. It didn't make any sense to me. I come to church, Sunday school, and there's palm leaves. It also didn't make any sense to me that people are really happy about Jesus coming to Jerusalem and then they get really angry with him a few days later and he's crucified. It made no sense to me. And then I remember as an older Christian coming to Christ and reading the stories of the entry into Jerusalem and couldn't find any palm leaves in the stories at all. In fact, it's only John's Gospel that mentions palm leaves. All the rest just talk about the disciples putting down their cloaks, but I guess Cloak Sunday sounds a bit silly. None of these stories made any sense to me, and I still think it's one of the great mysteries of our faith, and one of those sobering things we don't like to talk about too much, that on one day, we can yell out and cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then a few short days later, we cry out, crucify him. Because this is our lived experience. We can be a fickle people sometimes. The story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as it is often described or as, a, as a subheading in our Bibles, surely is dripping with irony. There is no triumph here. And the best way to understand this entry into Jerusalem is as what scholars call a public liturgy or what we might call a public protest. Biblical scholars and historians will tell us that there were two parades that day at the beginning of Passover week in Jerusalem. One coming in from the west, one coming in from the east. Passover in Jerusalem, as you can probably imagine, the centre of, of the Jewish people's understanding of who they are as the, the people of God. The economic and the religious and the political capital of the, of the Jewish people. In Passover week, the most important week in their history, it, it was a melting pot full of different ideas, full of nationalistic zealots. And the Romans were very uh, worried for civic unrest. And so at the beginning of Passover week, Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea at the time, the place there by the Roman powers, he had his own entry into Jerusalem. As I said, coming in from the west, just to remind people of the might of the Roman Empire. 
So he entered Jerusalem on a white stallion. He would have had um, a parade, a bit like the military parades we might see in today's world. He didn't have tanks and, and cannons, and, but he had soldiers and he had chariots. And he would have made a huge, big spectacle of the whole thing so people would remember that they were to behave. And so when Jesus and the disciples enter in from Jerusalem on the eastern side, they enter, Jesus enters not in on a white stallion, but rather on a donkey. It's a staged event. The, the scriptures tell us that. It was well planned. It was well thought through. Jesus wanted to enter Jerusalem as the prophecy from Zechariah 9 foretold. That the king would come to bring peace and he would enter on a donkey. Jerusalem, of course, means the city of peace. And, and this entry into Jerusalem is meant to evoke that dream of peace that God has for the world. And Luke captures it well. At the beginning of Luke's Gospel, when we celebrate this at Christmas time, in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, the people on the, on the ground look up and they see an angelic choir who are singing songs about peace on earth. And here, in this text, in Luke chapter 19, verse 38, we see, um, we see people on the ground singing may, to the heavens, may there be peace in heaven. Luke's dream for the world that he places on the mouth of Jesus is that we would know peace. And so I want to begin by, in this message by saying there are four things this text tells us that disciples need to do. And the first is that we need to be peacemakers. Peacemakers. Not just people who dream about peace or who long for peace or who live in peace with one another, but people who would make for peace. And it is a sobering reminder for us when we see the, the violent conflicts around the world in Ukraine and in other places that waging war is never a way to bring peace. There are many, many things that are placed upon our heart. Things that we desire for, things that we long for. Justice, righteousness. We may long for shelter for the homeless and food for the hungry. But these things in and of themselves are not things that make for peace. Scriptures tell us it's disciples who make for peace. And in order to make for peace, we need to be people of peace. We need to know peace in order for it to be known by others. And this begins, I want to suggest, through the way of prayer. May this week, may this holy week, as we commit ourselves to being peacemakers, may we return to the discipline of prayer, finding peace within ourselves, being at peace with our neighbours in order that we may make peace in the world. This entry into Jerusalem, this public liturgy, this public protest, make no mistake, this is also political. So if disciples are called to be peacemakers, disciples are also called to be political. I know that's very hard for Australians to grab hold of. You don't talk about faith or politics, especially at barbecues. But I want to suggest to you that disciples of Jesus are called to be political. Now we have a federal election coming up, and this isn't a campaign ad for either party, I can assure you. The problem with liberal democracies is we think politics is just about who you vote for at election time. Politics is about loving your neighbour. Politics is about working towards a good society. Good for all. Now, a lot of people would say that ministers shouldn't tell you how to vote. I'm going to tell you how to vote. Vote prayerfully. Pray before you vote. Pray that we might have a society where no one goes hungry, where there is good news for the poor, where no one lives with the threat of violence. Pray for a society where we look after the environment. Pray for a society where there is justice. And when that is your prayer, vote accordingly. 
It's not about which party you vote for. It's about being faithful to the call of Christ and the dream that God has for us all, that we might learn to love our neighbours. Disciples are called to be political. Disciples are also called to speak. In this story, uh, Jesus says, and the, the Pharisees are trying to tell the disciples to hush. They're making too much noise, too much commotion. Jesus says, if the disciples didn't speak, the very rocks would cry out. Disciples are called to speak. And if that's being the case, we should have something to say. And I want to suggest that if disciples are called to speak, it means that first we're called to listen. To listen to the voices that are all too often silenced. And to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit that is prompting us to bring good news. If disciples are called to be peacemakers, if disciples are called to be political, if disciples are called to speak, then we are also most definitely called to follow. This story is not about people waving and clapping and watching Jesus enter Jerusalem. This story is an invitation that we too might follow where Jesus is leading us. In our fellowship series this week, we will talk about Augusto Boal, a South American playwright and an activist, who said the problem with the world at large is that we have been shaped into being spectators. We prefer to watch the theatre unfold rather than to join in. We are not called to be spectators for this march into Jerusalem. We are called to be spec actors, to follow Jesus. And make no mistake, Jesus is going to the cross. This week prepares us for that event. On Thursday and Friday here at Albert Street, we will be talking about the themes of betrayal and denial and the darkness and the brokenness of the world in which we live and the ultimate price that Jesus paid because he had the courage to say enough. But of course our story doesn't end on a Friday. On Sunday we celebrate what Christians call the power of the resurrection, a celebration we find in an empty tomb. Today leads us to that day. We are called to follow Jesus to the cross, to the empty tomb, and beyond. Folks, living as Christians in today's world is not just about reading an ancient story and uh, going to bed with a smile on our face, knowing that it all ends up okay in the end. Following Jesus in today's world is always asking ourselves that question, what comes next? If we dare to follow Jesus into Jerusalem, if we dare to follow Jesus to the cross, if we dare to follow Mary and Martha to the empty tomb, what comes next? This week we would ask you to pray about that, to reflect upon that. We do have a federal election coming up. These are important times for us as a society. What comes next? This is integral to our discipleship. And I urge you to pray about it this week. Let's pray. God, thank you that your ancient story comes alive through baptism, through worship, through our discipleship. May this week, this holy week, enliven our faith once more, that we might count the cost, that we might join with the suffering of this world and find the courage to say enough, and that we might find the joy and the celebration and the wonder of the empty tomb, reminding us that your promise to us is that in the end, love wins. And God, help us then in our praying, in our faithfulness, in our following, to ask the question, what comes next? 
knowing that in you we will indeed find our answer. In Jesus' name we pray.